Uh, let's uh, figure the share screen, which has been more straightforward on Zoom, thankfully. Uh, let's see, let me know when you see the keynote here. Okay, sweet. Um, let's see, up and down is working. Yeah, I kind of wrote here stuff TLC 36 already uh, rocks at. Uh, this is a really important skill because you know, traditionally engineers, you know, the people think, well, it's only about technology. It's only knowing how to work with a code, but really a big part is working with people because the other people will be looking at your code. They'll need to troubleshoot your code. You need to be able to communicate to stakeholders, user uh, design, whoever else in the world. And this group has been pretty impressive with that. I'm learning from you folks as much as I'm providing the hope. So it's going to be odd presentation to be giving, but you know, you might be able to pick up a, a thing or two there. But if you kind of keep thinking, wait, this is a common sense. I already know this. Well, you, you kind of do. So just to put out that disclaimer up front, I don't think anything here will be like, oh, wow, really? I had no idea. Um, I mean, especially if you look at all the PRs and all that, we'll, we'll get back to that one. I added a few quick examples to the slide because nobody said I couldn't. So mm -hmm. I did. Um, and so imagine that, you know, you have a code base you're working on, you went to vacation. So, you know, if you're from Colorado, you went to Hawaii, if you're from Hawaii, you went to Colorado, whatever. And while you were gone, there was this bug and somebody went to your code, added this fix and left. And sure, the bug is not there on production right now, but you're looking at this code and thinking, uh, what the heck happened here? And I'm not gonna insult your intelligence by asking what's wrong. Obviously there are comments here. But if you like compare the one below, like you'll notice it's a day and night in knowing what the heck is happening. Because if you look at the one in the middle, you have a much better idea of why that was done. Um, and like the, the one additional step, which is a little bit of advice I can give you here. So is there anything else you would add to the comment in the middle? comment about until devs are back in the office that one yeah to the to middle one yeah is there anything else you would add there it, it looks pretty self-contained but there's usually one more step that, that sometimes people miss and that's the one i would probably kind of like a nice example throwing here uh so maybe should, yeah oh, sorry maybe something Come about on. like why you can't modify the back end directly or yes. like yeah yep. like why yeah. that's happening i guess yeah yeah and so what DJ said, right, this links to, well, there's something wrong in the back and this is linked to the bigger things. So usually the one step ahead you want to be doing is telling people where to look for that stuff. Like, well, what actually happened here? And like this wouldn't mean much to you because we don't know what the ticket is or what's the, the PR, but it points people to where they should go look at the stuff. So that ticket will probably have, here's the broke from customers. Here's what might be happening on the back end in this release and stuff like that. Uh, what a link this thing to the other things, link to documentation. Slack is less permanent, so I'm hesitant to link to it, but you know, point to the other things, you know, because you have no idea uh, how many people were involved in this, was there any conversation? So point people out where they can go and look for them if it's outside of PR. And as, as you notice, this group is already doing that. So again, kind of the odd example to be putting there, but you have no idea how much in your career, you'll be like on both ends of the spectrum. So sometimes you'll just need to lead by example or educate others. Um, I'll, this slide cracks me up so much because do you see that the true equality? And I keep thinking, sure, I get the point, but should I really be two equal signs, not three, they're different types. One is emoji, the other is word, but whatever. But yeah, the communication is uh, the key. It's and it's more than just what we're gonna cover here, but it's also um, about presenting your work, about fitting in the larger scheme, working with people, networking and all that. It's, it's a really it's a huge crucial skill that I myself and will be probably working for the rest of my life and all that. And right here, I just added uh, the three things we'll cover here. It's gonna be a little bit about documentation, pull requests and comments and code. And I made this like yellow highlight here for this equality sign because whatever, let's be literal developers sometimes. 
And, you know, it's as examples, I'm going to use one of uh, our examples. Like, this is pretty amazing. It's like, well, here, make sure you're local is in this environment. Here's what you should add. And here are the external resources that will help you do this. Um, in, in some cases, you might even have luxury of time and all that, especially in larger teams, is you tell them, well, just go click on this button. It will populate this fake test data for you. But this is like the crucial step you should be doing. Like, don't let people guess how the heck to test your feature. Like, it's all here. So it's kind of cool to be using this group as an example. Well, here's how to do it. Uh, so we're going to start with documentation. And you'll notice that it's the things that are both for you and others in both present and the future. Like, that thing will keep uh, coming up. Uh, so let's say you're like coding, coding, coding. And you re realize, you know what? I should go look at the epoch date, or this is a string. It should have been a date or something else. You know, write that down. You might go for lunch. Then, you know, you might need to go pick up your dog from daycare. And the next day you'll be thinking, well, shit, why did I do this? Or you'll get distracted. You'll move to something else. Like leave these little notes for yourself, which will then help other people too. Um, I did want to mention something about institutional knowledge. That's the one that keeps happening, at least in my experience, more than I, more than I should. Um, you know, if you and let's say this team, you know why you're doing something, you're never gonna think, well, if somebody shows up and looks at my code, they won't know why we're we using tail CSS, uh, tailwind CSS, for example, or uh, why are we doing this thing in Firebase and all that. So you always think, what if this new person shows up? what should they know to be able to work with your project and it's an art because if you drown it with data then it's not really that useful either but it's an art you can kind of figure out over time um this documentation this documentation example here is kind of neat because on one side it has the code and the other side it has um the actual text and i I wasn't really sure what it means optimized for the person who needs a quick uh, reference, but I assume that really means is that like don't write a novel, make it like quick and easy to look at, which again is something uh, we will be doing. So I wanted to make sure just talking about documentation, do you have any examples or work or didn't, any thoughts you want to add? Because I believe you also learned a lot and have something to contribute. If not, I can keep going, but I'm curious for the group things. Um, one thing I found that my team at First Star asked me to do, like if I build a new component, like at the very top, there needs to be at least like a note about what this component is doing, like one liner, Ooh, good one. Yes. you know what I mean? Just, and, and yep. I, you know, I, I submitted a PR and I was like, oh, cool. I'd never even thought to do that because I know what it's doing, but yep. for future people, for myself, others, you know, it's like, you can just look at the very top and know exactly what this thing is supposed yeah. to do. So yeah, I thought that was a really cool tip. And I'm and I'm guilty of forgetting that with my code, but every time I look at somebody else's code, it's easy to recommend go do it. But that, that seems that's a huge one. Yep. And of course, through because through this project, you're probably exposed to many new things you haven't before. You can see which documentation works, which one doesn't. Uh, any other examples, thoughts about documenting code? I like hearing examples because I always get very nervous about writing too much once I get started. So yeah, oh, yeah. I really like being able to have these guidelines and like what examples I can add. Yeah, and I would because I'm kind of the same way I write novels. What I would say is because you know we're thinking how much to write can take time and energy. What I would do is do your thing, write the novel, and then on top just write too long didn't read. Here's a quick summary. You want to read the whole thing, Lindsay wrote? Look it right here. So like. Do what you do, but just also add that uh, summary too, because in the stuff you write, there's lots, like, I love your comments, so it's definitely useful. Um, okay, let's uh, jump to the next one. And I'm kind of adding these examples in between. This is like your code, this is stuff I love. Like, see this here, it kind of tells you. Um, so imagine you're looking at this code without any context. You would think the person who put this here. It's like, oh yeah, this is it, this is final, this is perfect, don't touch it. Like you'd be afraid to look at it, oh, sorry, to change it. But if you look at the comment on top, it kind of tells you, well, you know, I kind of looked at this and we might want to go and change this in the future. It's not urgent, we shouldn't be breaking anything, but you know, if you want to work on this, it's cool. 
And this is harder than it sounds, at least in my experience, because um, you know you have to be confident enough to admit that maybe something needs more work. Uh, like notice how this word might, there's like uncertainty there. That's, I always admire people who communicate they're not sure about something or they need to learn something or this may or may not be adjusted. This is the reason why I love this group because what I noticed is what happens with time, people feel this pressure to always look like they know what they're doing. And sure, in some cases, the confidence feels great, especially with stakeholders, right? You want basically to them, you're a wizard, it makes magic happen. But I always love working for developers to kind of know what I think about it and that kind of helps me get a better feel for the code and all that it's almost like being like writing like a stream of consciousness and notes there it's like i love this example right here um our pull requests are amazing again this one feels silly to be covering but we shall yep i'm gonna add what i keep mentioning in slack here is now that you have a, your code on public GitHub, show your PRs to people you're interviewing with. I mean, that is awesome stuff. Like, be loud about it. Post it, I don't know, your portfolio. I don't think you can go to resume unless maybe like a link to your work, but you have great PRs. You show them to people. Um, I think we're already rocking this part, so this is high you're all shining. So I'll ask if there's anything you want to contribute about PRs. Like, do you feel they might take up too much time to write in detail? Do you find them easy to work with? Uh, how do you feel about the way the common thing is structured? Do you have any thoughts about PRs? I like them a lot. There's some... There's a lot of scrolling sometimes going on. Oh, yeah. there's a bunch of comments. If you've like, you know, I don't know, time zone, gone to sleep or whatever. And I think that's more of a GitHub thing than anything else. But um, yeah. I love them. I mean, and we have used them really well. We like literally communicate through them. We're not just yeah. ticking a box saying we added a PR. You yeah. know, it's, they're good. And you're hitting pretty well on scrolling a lot. There's this really rough balance of how, what should be in Slack versus what should be in GitHub. I've experienced the cases where people, because see, Slack is easier, but whatever you post in Slack in a few days or weeks, you're gonna lose track of it. So I keep, you know, in my um, recent cases, it was more like, well, just go put in GitHub, go put in GitHub, heck, even link to Slack if you have to. Uh, but in this case, I feel like it's the outer opposite extreme. Like everything is in GitHub and GitHub is pain to navigate. And I do wish one day they'll just uh, make it easier to, to go through. But I like, like if you're not sure, erring on side of GitHub is better because GitHub has this history. Like you can look at a pull request and see what happened there. But it's interesting balance because if you get a conversation going in Slack, you might forget to put in GitHub, which is why I like that this group is doing it in GitHub in the first place. Um, I'm gonna jump to the next one. Again, I'm between these and put examples of work well, I I like this one a lot. It just kind of tells me, yeah, here's, here's what's happening. It's, you know, kind of your usual common thing. There's nothing really super crazy going in here, but you don't have to spend all this extra thinking of well, what does this thing do? You can like look at a comment on top and then skip the rest if you're in a rush. Like that to me is a good comment. So I'm just using the work you folks did as a good example. just move this little thing right here yeah and i'm gonna you can see what's written here i'm just gonna add real quick to number two that yeah code might be obvious what it does especially if the naming is pretty clear but in 99 percent of the cases there's always something to be adding so let's say you're converting string to date well sure that's obvious but why do you have this so you can say well, maybe the database isn't doing it for you. Maybe this is very temporary until we create the utility. And again, it's something that I think this team is doing great. Uh, let's see here, focus on what we're doing, then what this code does. Let me go and open this one real quick because when I was doing the slides, for some reason, this hasn't opened for me. Ah, and now it's working, oh, sweet. 
let me know when you see my desktop. I want to share this example real quick. Yeah, we can see it. We can see. Yeah. And you know, this is some pretty well written code. Um, but again, I feel like this is something we're nailing pretty well. Uh, I was moving slides from PowerPoint to Keynote so I can add things. And for some reason, the links were working for me, but now they are. So I thought I should just like open this example. But I don't think for us is as uh, critical. Um, you'll, and if you see, if you encounter cases where people are saying if code says one plus one is two or A plus A is B, and the comment says add A plus A is B, that's the good time for PRs to say, uh, yeah, but why, why are we doing this? Don't tell me what a code does. Tell me why was this code written? So, so I'll get to that one in a second. Since I think this is something that you as a group is doing awesome, is there anything you want to share about um, commenting the code? How do you feel about it and all that? Like, I think this is a time where we can like learn from each other because all these examples already cover what you do. I think like when we're teaching, something is doing would be a nice like addition for us to maybe like put a quick one line summary at the top of it with component so we kind of just can quickly go to it and have an idea, add item. Oh yeah, that's the form where you submit a new item and things like that. So that'd be nice to try. Yeah. Okay, anybody else before I conclude? Okay, so when I was looking through this uh, PowerPoint originally, I was like, well, wait, the group is already like gets this. If there's one piece of, I don't know, hint or advice or something what I'll think of, it'd be like this little table right here. When you're writing documentation, pull requests, code, anything real that's written down, this is a good thing to check off. It has this thing that's written for you, would this be useful to you tomorrow? So it'd be maybe something like uh, to do, optimize this code, to do, figure out whether data is not working. That will check off this part right here. Uh, but then if you come to this code six months from now, like you would need to probably know a little bit more. Like why does this whole class exist? What does this component do? So the example that uh, Lindsay and DJ talked about is, you know, tell in the beginning of the component, why is this thing here? Uh, you, when you look at the, you know, the whole tree structure, you want to know as you click on each, to you know where it fits and all that. And the same way, you know, make sure you're taking care of the other people as well. Like what do your teammates need to know in the, the present, which I'm calling here short term future, like today, tomorrow, this week, this, this sprint, this PR release, what, uh, as you work with people. And if somebody who hasn't seen this code forever that works with you or for the first time, what do they need to know? So I think if you manage to check these four off, like you're golden, like that would be kind of my, how I'm, I'm making sure I'm not missing anything. Like that's my little uh, cheat sheet I got there. I almost wrote here as present, but that's ambiguous. It's more like short term and long term. Okay. And that is it. This part is just sharing experiences, which I've kind of been nudging through this whole conversation, seeing if there's anything else uh, you'd like to, to add. I think we kind of covered this. This is like a last chance to kind of add something. Okay. And then, yeah, use the, the rest of the time with the, the Colab lab. Like you're basically practicing this. Give each other feedback. We're like learning from each other. I'm learning a lot from you folks as well. It's, it's been pretty impressive seeing how you pick up a new framework and how you share knowledge with each other. Um, I'm really, really loving this. It's really uh, impressive. Okay, let's stop the screen share. Okay. Now, let's see. What's next? Eddie, it's demos now, right? Yeah, yeah. Awesome job, Rudy. Um, so, yeah, we are heading into demos. So, I guess, do we have a team that wants to go first? Anybody have an opinion on Probably what makes the most sense? Oh, I didn't hear. We should go, or oh, you want to go? You guys should go. Okay. Uh, so I will share screen and start. Uh, so this week, uh, we had to add a filter. So we should allow like user to 
make user able uh, to filter his items, to, like, to help him to find a particular item. So one of the uh, acceptance criteria was, so filter should change while you type in, uh, and, uh, by, and also filter should match any part of the word. So this is like most important thing. Okay. So for this one, uh, we had to add input field, and we added a button next to input field, input field. So you can click it, or you can use a tab and enter, so it will work. Okay. And I will show you how it works. Uh, so for instance, you see if I try Apple, so I already have like all items that have this uh, combination. Uh, so I think it's more. So also like extras, uh, we did some extras. Extras we added a loading gif. So when uh, items are loaded, so the user will see a gif. And also, ah, okay, I forgot. So also we updated add item list. So now we're using toast. Like before, we used like a regular notification. What do we need? Uh, okay. So we see. And also, oh, also we added one extra feature. When the user uh, loads the, the page for first time, the input field will be focused. So it like makes uh, for user like so user doesn't need to click again. And we did the same for add item and for list field. So, and we use the Tailwind to style uh, our input field, and uh, we used icon, but uh, I, I React icon uh, for this button. So, I think, Lindsay? Yeah, Lena taught me about East Res for the focus, which was really cool to see that hook. Um, and so, I think list layout is where the filtering is really happening in the code. We did it in the return. Um, where we're mapping the list, we just filter it before it's sent to the map. Um, for if it includes that that filter word, lowercase, um, because I think the item ID that is the normalized uh, lowercase already in the database. And so we're just comparing it to the filter, which we're also lowercasing. So that the includes will come back with our expected result. Um, so that's kind of how that's really the main uh, part that we that is handling that search functionality. And then we really just integrated the changes um, with the we reorganized some of the layout because we we're I think having an issue with the loading and use ref I think that's kind of what really spurred us to like move this into another component and then have a that list view that's rendering the list layout like to go down a state because of the loading screen and then also the use ref uh, to be able to focus it. So that kind of inspired that and it works pretty well. Uh, that loading GIF is really nice that Elena found and added. Um, so yeah, really happy. It's going nice to be a, an app. Yeah, that's like, great. But do you have any questions? Okay. Yeah, really nice job. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I love um, you know, the idea of getting into something and being like, this is starting to be really complex. Like we should break it down right to another component. Um, and that's something that I've seen happen a lot, like in, um, like in PRs at my job, like someone will get into the code and they'll start off and it's like, okay, this is a small component at first, but over time it gets bigger and bigger. And suddenly there's a lot going on. And so oftentimes like one of the most useful things of PRs, you know, speaking of PRs um, at my job has been other people looking in at someone's component being like, oh, I know you're really close to it. So you're, you know, but this is starting to balloon and we should probably create like two components or three components. Like here's some stuff that seems different enough. You could break it out. And so definitely, I think 
as apps grow, like getting into that rhythm of like, hey, this is getting big. It's getting unwieldy. How can we make it more reusable, maintainable? And I think Rudy posted some stuff about that in Slack as well. Um, so great to great to see you all, you know, kind of embracing that. I think it's going to be really helpful. And the I also like the idea that besides the component, it's just like a little uh, utility functions. Like, you know, we're, we're doing that text comparison. If it equal equals to the lowercase, you might want to encapsulate that and find, like do the comparison or find items or like even are these the same? So then that function will have to lowercase. So if in the future, if you change your mind where the comparison criteria, it, ugh, criteria is, it's just in one place rather than uh, uh, multiple. And it, it's just this natural part as your app grows. It's kind of cool to see the see getting there. Yeah, that's that's a good call out as well. Like oftentimes at our company, you'll end up with oftentimes like areas of you know your app. You'll have like a constants file where you have a bunch of like random constants that all are kind of grouped together that you export. And then like you'll have a utilities file or if you have a bunch of utilities, a utilities folder with all sorts of utilities files in it. And um, yeah, you'll definitely find as an app grows bigger, you'll want to get all this stuff breaking down into small bits so that it's more reusable. Cool. We'll hand it over to DJ and Shelly. Okie dokie. So um, our task was to use the calculate estimate function to update um, the estimate, the previous estimate, and to start getting smart um, to change. So it won't just be the 7, 14, or 30 days that we entered at the beginning. Um, so this is a, a brand new one, and I had to tweak it a little bit so that we could test it. So um, the three items I added, they're all created at sometime in January. Um, and then I also gave them a fake purchase date sometime before today so that we could see it. But they still have their original um, uh, frequencies because I haven't clicked it again. So when we click on Apple, am I over? Yes, I'm highlighting Apple. When we click on Apple, the purchase date changes to today and the previous estimate is there. We have a problem because we have uh, messed up on what a day is in um, uh, Unix timestamp. We were using math.pow and it doesn't do exponents the way we thought it did. And this is, we found out after we pushed it. So it's fixed now, but it hasn't been merged yet because there's still another date problem we're working on. But whenever you click on it, we are at least getting, let's see, here's coffee. So coffee is now getting a new date. And the numbers are better now. They do work. Um, uh, there's just something weird still happening with strings that we don't understand that we're going to talk about after this, I think. Okay. DJ, you get to talk about the code, which I do not have pulled up. Do you have it to share? Oh, yes. Um... And while I'm getting that, I should just shout out literally everybody here because this was definitely one of those weeks that took a village. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so like all of the help and comments from literally everybody here, like, thank you. Um, Shelly and I racked our brains for like hours. What was that, Monday or Tuesday? And then like office hours on Wednesday, yesterday. Like, it was just like, I don't know. I don't know what it was about this, but we were just all like, what's, what's happening? Um, Okay. But then when all four of us got together yesterday, the four of us, it just came together in, in a minute. Um, yeah. So that was really awesome. For sure. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking at main right now uh, in our file. So we did move everything over to list layout. But basically one big thing that we changed was set update to DB. Uh, this was kind of like a generalized uh, function to send updates for an item. Um, but the way that we were using it last week only involved changing one property, right? The date, the purchase date, but now we need to send a whole object. In addition, we also needed to kind of think about, well, what data do we need from the object to get the calculate estimate function to work properly? Uh, so that's where we added in the uh, created at field and the total purchases, which is another thing that we'll be keeping track of. 
Um, so yeah, we updated this function here on nine through 12, and then down here, starting at 31, uh, well, really this handle checkbox change. So whenever a user clicks on that checkbox, uh, this is whenever everything is going to happen. So we first find that item based on the item ID, matching um, the, uh, yeah, the target name of that item. And then um, Eddie's amazing refactoring ideas for these two variables totally made sense to like figure out what is the date of last transaction and the day since last transaction before doing like these complicated if statements. So this is again, just checking does, has the item been purchased before? Uh, if yes, then use the previous purchase date or the purchase date. If not, use the created at, um, and that's kind of what we landed on. And then day since last transaction, again, just using um, the current time minus that date of last transaction divided by one day. Uh, one thing that we're considering, I think still is adding in moment.js. Um, I personally, uh, like, I don't know, I, I, I think the dates can be really hard, especially when we're dealing with massive numbers and we know that JavaScript is not the best with math. Um, so it, it just kind of seems like maybe pulling in a library uh, to simplify would be cool. But like Shelly said, we do have the one day kind of figured out. It's just, it, yeah, we just have a couple other things. So basically if the target, if the item is checked, uh, we create this entire object now. Uh, and that is, again, just updating the previous estimates. Um, days, uh, let's see, where are we at? Oh, no, so previous estimate is where we run calculate estimate function. So this is the utility that gets stored there. Total purchases, we add one. And then uh, the purchase date then becomes the current time. Uh, and so we, again, use that function from above to just send that entire object off into Firestore. Um, so again, yeah, walking through it, it seems very, you know, very straightforward, but, um, you know, it definitely a lot of, uh, a lot of steps and just kind of like looking at each other, like, hmm, what are we, what are we missing here? What's happening? Um, but I think we got there. So yeah, we just have to clean up some dates, time stuff and land on a decision for that. Um, but other than that, I think the functionality is basically working. Something that cracks me up is line five in the code says on cross. And I thought it was, wait, did you tell me to spill and cross? And then I realized, well, it's I am. So you might put yeah. like icon or something. Cause I was like, yeah. what is he trying to tell me here? Totally, um, yeah, yeah. It kind of inspired me. I noticed that you had like a database on one side and the code on the other. Sorry, not the code, but the browser. But something if, and this kind of helps you to know if your components are done the right way. Usually what you could do, because all the data is gonna end up on front end as well. If you go to that React inspector and you look at each component, you can see um, all the data as well that's in the database. Um, so like in your case, if you like have a list and you do a component for each row, then that debugging gets easier. And that's something yeah, we, that matters for small project, but you'll notice as it grows, it will be more of a thing. Yeah, we were using that um, on Wednesday a bunch. It just and the database. Did, did it work well enough? It was kind of odd when I tried it. It gave me the the components remained odd. I don't know why. I'm kind of new with the React. Uh, the I think I saw stuff. Rudy. I think I saw what you were seeing with the components named. Like that's uh, maybe they're showing the names of what's being rendered without JSX. So uh, like if you okay. have like something dot whatever, like that's that's after JSX is run through, like that's literally what's being put um, like onto the DOM, I guess. So different names, what well, we don't usually see. <laughs> I wonder, I, if I have time, I'd like to look into it. I almost wonder if you need to give a components a name or something, because it's supposed to tell you list item, list row, and you used to do that earlier, but as a code grew, it kind of broke that. And I almost wonder if it's just missing the component name. Like in Vue.js, you need to tell it, yeah, this is the name of the component. I also want to know what to show. Um, but it's, it's not critical to worry about. Like it works well enough. I'll just poke I, around it when you do a push to kind of see what's Yeah, it was hard to find it. But then once you had that component open, then it was easy to watch. But yeah, it's not, it's not in an obvious place. Yeah, I think it's a dev yeah, versus production. Like, I think if you do a dev build, 
it should have the names, oh, but then that, in production, because of the compile time, like, yeah, 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 you know, yeah, 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 yeah. So okay, this is yeah, the, it's under context, context yeah. provider right now. Yeah. Because if this is a production one, then it should be obfuscated. Yeah. I'm even surprised that yeah. it works at all production. That could yeah, be, yeah, it works, but it's, yeah, confusing. Because like, if we are looking at our local machines um, at my company, then you see like it normal. But if you go on the QA or the stage, it runs a production build. And so then it's like, I can't, Sweet. can't get it to figure out what's what, you know, so, yeah. So in this case, we're lucky that it even worked because Vue.js won't let you do use in production, I don't think. So great, no complaints then. Does anybody feel like talking about the new weirdness? The strength thing? Is this, yeah, is this the appropriate time for it? Uh, Probably. I will say it we're a little it ahead of schedule, no? I should say it went away for me like after one or two times it, it went back to a number so so it's happening in the less than two or something that's what it is maybe, right maybe yeah um, let me open it real quick i just i just just want eyes on it for a nanosecond um well okay. yeah, i love those issues that like only happen when the set of three or four criteria happen. Yeah. So if you, because when I was testing it, I kept clicking over and over. So all of my test cases had four or five purchase date purchases. And that's why I didn't see the problem. But if they have zero, one, or two, or maybe it's just zero or one, it comes out as a string. So the first thing I changed was we were not using 24 hours in milliseconds. I was using math.pow, which changes the base. It's not base 10. So thank you for seeing that, Alina, because I never even would have questioned it. So then I realized the number's not really that big. Let's just put it in. So now one day works perfectly. Um, I also threw a two fixed on our um, day since last transaction. So we didn't have 14 points and then you know 20 decimals after that. It was ridiculous. But everything returns a number. So it's got to be in this, it's not the, it's, it's got to be in the function. Okay, maybe we don't need to look at it and we'll just talk about it more when whoever goes into that one. And is that branch committed or not yet? Um, I put in, it's not merged yet. It's committed though. It's, okay. I have a new branch. I put in a new pull request if you want to preview there was an and error. play with it. I don't know if you saw it's, my comment, but there's an error. I, yeah, I took those out. out. So yeah. has it passed yet? It still hasn't uh, passed. Why hasn't it passed? the funny thing is those were in the previous and it didn't hold it up so maybe there's something else wrong with it it was failing from my push to from the oh end, it was so it was still yeah i didn't catch that and then i saw it later no, and then I, I saw you making a new one so i see a check mark in the pull request now it's passed yeah. now yeah yeah and also a branch missed some lb errors that's it let me check it out because okay, I can poke around it. Well. Oh no, SM data refactor. Sorry. Ah, okay, okay. I just knocked it out this morning because we'd already closed. I mean today because we'd already closed the other branch or the other issue. I guess I could have still used our branch. Oh. I don't know. So why does it doesn't see the branch exists here? But that could be on me. Oh, SM date, not data. That is true. SM dash SM dash refactor. But if we go get branch, it should show me a list of all the branches, right? That I pulled. Uh, that shows your local, yeah, the ones you've pulled. Branch should be yeah, show. Yeah, did a git pull already up to date and get branch. Whatever, I'm gonna copy up GitHub so I can get it going. In this moment, special shout out to Lindsay and her absolutely amazing to watch physical merge because they made the new component. So we did all yeah. of our code in the old component and she had to move it all, all of it over to hers. And it's like, it broke once, you finished like one thing and then it all worked. It was insane. 
and very fast. So that was gonna be a lot harder than it was. It was pretty easy. <laughs> but it's, it's you made easy. it look easy. <laughs> Like if you guys are watching, it's really easy to stay focused. I'm like, okay, pressure's on, gotta focus and get this right. So that is a a good skill to have is not to run away from merge conflicts terrifying because oftentimes it is simpler than you think it will be, but the vast majority of people get really scared of merge conflicts and run away. Like legitimately at my last company, like only two people dealt with merge conflicts. Like everyone else in the company didn't touch them, which was a very bad way for the company to work. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, a bunch of professional developers that are like, oh, I'm not touching that merge conflict. So when we're also involved in the code, it makes it easier too, because I was watched, we were going through your code for like an hour, I think. And then I did that and I had a really good understanding of what was happening. So that's really nice. Awesome. Working together and definitely helps, right? Like, cause you understand what's going on. Cool. Um, so I guess we will hop over to new issues unless there's anything else. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, cause we can brainstorm data out or, or whatever too. Let's see here. All right, so we've got our um, groups. This week is Elena and DJ, and then group two is Shelly and Lindsay. So we've got uh, issue number 11. As a user, I wanna be able to delete items from my shopping list so that my list isn't cluttered with items that I don't want to buy in the future. So we are Marie condoing your shopping list. Um, if it doesn't bring you joy, then delete it. All right. Um, so your acceptance criteria, you need to be able to delete an item. That's probably not surprising. Before deleting, we want to confirm that they want to delete the item, right? Anytime something's destructive, you want to try to uh, get a second confirmation. And then deletion should cause the associated records in the database to be deleted. So that is a Hard delete, not a soft delete. Soft delete being where people like to keep data in the database. That is for things that are like potential, like really, really sensitive stuff. And it's like, because once you delete it from the database, there's no restoring it. So sometimes you might have a soft delete and soft delete is going to say, great, we're going to mark a field in this to say this thing has been quote deleted and we're not going to return it to lists and stuff, but we're going to keep it in the database in case something really bad happens. Um, in, the, in this case, we're just doing a hard delete and deleting it entirely. Um, we've got a wireframe here that shows the confirmation dialog. Um, so there's a note here that, you know, modals are like the default of everyone, but modals are very difficult when it comes to accessibility. Um, so consider using a simple JavaScript confirm dialog. I will also say that is, right, there's a lot of reasons that you, like, sometimes might not use a bunch of external, like, component libraries, but definitely, like, if you have some kind of component library you're using, like, that's definitely a great time to use, like, a modal, um, like, to lean on a modal from a component library that has dealt with all those accessibility things. Um, because even at my last company, we were building our own component library. And the one thing that um, our team decided to not do was build our own modal. <laughs> they are terrifying. Uh, but yeah, so here you've got a delete button and you need your confirmation dialog. So you all can figure out what you want to do with that. Um, and then number two. As a user, I want to view a list of my shopping list items in order, so we're sorting, of how soon I'm likely to need to buy each item again. So that's clear, I need to buy it soon. So obviously you're familiar with these three things because they're selections, right? I need to buy it soon, fewer than seven days. I need to buy it kind of soon, seven to 30 days. And I need to buy it not soon, more than 30 days. 
And now we have this other thing inactive when there's only one purchase in the database or the purchase is really out of date. Meaning the time that has elapsed since the last purchase is two times what was estimated. So that will be a, a fun little thing to <laughs> figure out. Um, your acceptance criteria, they should be visually distinct, right? According to how soon you expect to buy them. So you need some kind of thing to easily glance and know when something's soon, kind of soon, uh, kind of prioritization visually there. Items should be sorted by the esti estimated number of days until next purchase. Items with the same number of estimated days should be sorted alphabetically. That's always a good catch because a lot of times, um, you know, you might sort things once, but not a lot of apps that aren't really going the extra mile do like a double sort. So that's always something to keep in mind. Like there can be multiple things that like are true about this sorting method. So how, how deep do you go into the sort? Um, and then items in different states should be described distinctly when read by a screen reader. And let's see here, criteria for an item being inactive has tripped up teams in the past. So it's been reworded re to be more clear. Um, but the key is, right, if the estimate is two days and it has been four days, then now it's inactive. So if you run into any questions there, definitely feel free to reach out. But hopefully the new language is more clear. Um, oh, huh, they had a, an example there. Look at that. All right. Teams in the past have also over-engineered here by breaking the list into separate groups. Um, but it should be achievable in a single list with different visual treatments. So you don't need to necessarily break out whole different like sections of the app. Um, and be sure to not only use a color to denote when the user needs to buy the item. Um, and it has the wireframe here. So it mentions using an ARIA label to denote how soon the user will need to be able to buy in addition to the coloring that they've done here. Um, and that's a big thing, like oftentimes in to-do apps, someone will just use color and you also want to do like arrows, right? Like an up arrow and a down arrow to like give that visual indication um, that that is different because while they mention an ARIA label, you also have color blindness, which is going to be a complicating factor. So I wouldn't just rely on ARIA and color as well. I would step into that even deeper and say, okay, we need to have some kind of icon or some kind of text to kind of help denote that. Um, that way, if someone you know, can't see the color differences, they don't think that this stuff is all the same. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, hey, look, Rudy, A+. Plus. Yeah, that guy's so. like really pinated right there. <laughs> no, that's excellent. Um, so yeah, definitely recommend using symbols next to the checkbox or text or a tag or whatever else kind of comes to your all's minds. Um, so yeah, and don't be tied to a solution. You could use subgroups um, and different things like that. I do like, like, that's cool, add soon, like as a shortcut of having to click add a new button. And then like they have to select the radio button. Like if you have, if you do have subgroups or something like that, being able to have a shortcut to say, I wanna, I know something needs to be added soon. I'm gonna click on that and it automatically selects. That's some cool usability thing. So feel free to yeah, brainstorm and think what you uh, think what comes to mind. And, and I have a favorite example how to do something like this, but I, I want to keep my mouth shut so everybody can be like creative and do it their way because I'm really curious to see how folks are going to do it. It's a fun one. Like, you know, it's a fun problem to have. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, do we have any takers um, for, I guess I'll switch back to 11. Do we have any takers for issue 11? Crickets, everyone wants issue 12. <laughs> I'm honestly not that picky and I don't have like a lot of time commitments. So I'm kind of just deferring to everyone else. 
not gonna lie after last week i would kind of prefer a little bit more of a straightforward task so my vote would be for 11 for elena and i i know she likes to take on like the challenging ones so so like i'm not gonna hold you back if, if you want to do that too but like um my vote would be for 11 but again happy to do either i agree yeah we can take 11. Yeah, all right agree and I have more time this week than I did last week, Lindsay. So I won't, yeah. uh, I won't be a big flake. I, I like hope. A, I love it. It's like a deep dive engineering and Paul is kind of yeah. like flow design, like empathy for users. And yeah, others. that's what it seems like. It's more like styling and stuff, which I would like to learn and be better at. It would be interesting to see like how DJ and Elena style it too, but um, obviously like we'll probably set up a foundation and then we can all chime in as we get there. Yeah, and you know, the fun part is posting this in Slack and then you can post the screenshot and collaborate because it's it, it's really showing that you're thinking about the users outside of code. I, I love problems like that. Awesome. Well, I know we normally create branches, but I know that the branches are still potentially we've got another merge request still going so do we want to do what we did last week where we just say hey whenever everyone feels like everything's wrapped up just post in the channel um and yeah sweet yeah. that sounds good um i went ahead and created the threads um in slack that 